I'm Brad Edwards. Thank you for streaming with us here on CBS News Chicago. We're marking the anniversary of one of the most notorious unsolved mass killings in American history. 40 years ago, seven people died in Chicago and its suburbs. One family paid the greatest toll. Three died, all within a few hours. The common denominator, they all took extra strength Tylenol. That discovery led to the removal and destruction of Tylenol bottles nationwide. CBS2 investigator Dave Savini traveled to Wisconsin in this heart-wrenching interview with the surviving members of the Janus family. When I see this bottle, it takes me back to the most tragic moment of my family's life. Monica Janis was just a child when a killer deliberately laced Tylenol capsules with cyanide and placed the tainted bottles on the shelves of stores around the Chicago area. Do you think they'll ever solve this crime? I hope so. Before I die, I hope I see the person. The death of 35-year-old Paula Prince stunned her family and friends. Her body was discovered last night inside her apartment on Chicago's near north side. People were poisoned, and as the body count started to rise... This product may be contaminated with cyanide and should be destroyed. So did the fear. Paula was murdered. She was just murdered. Cyanide contaminated Tylenol has been responsible for three deaths in the Arlington Heights area. Not take Tylenol until further notice. It was everywhere, because Tylenol's a thing that everyone uses. There were seven confirmed cases. 12-year-old Mary Kellerman was a student at Jane Addams Junior High in Schaumburg, and according to school officials, she had a cold, which is probably why she took the contaminated Tylenol. She died yesterday morning. It was 40 years ago to the day, September 29th, 1982. It was very scary and sad to think Wow, our family is just falling and dying. Three members of Monica Janice's family were murdered. She was only eight at the time. Everybody's sobbing and crying. Just a few years younger than her daughter, Isabel. On September 29, 1982. Isabel recently wrote an essay for school on how the Tylenol murders destroyed her family. What kind of a person does something like that? An evil person person that just doesn't care about people. In Chicago today, city inspectors began checking stores to be certain all Tylenol was off the shelf. Serial killer. Yeah. Her great uncle, Adam Janice, a physically fit 27-year-old mailman, wasn't feeling well when he woke up for work. He unknowingly bought tainted Tylenol at Jewel in Arlington Heights and collapsed later at home. So when they told my family that he died from a heart attack, they couldn't believe it. They're like, they're, why would he die from heart attack? At first, the family was told Adam's heart failed. And after they weeped over his body, they left the hospital. Her other great uncle, Stanley Janice, and newly wedded wife, Teresa, then went to Adam's house. The tainted bottle was still there. They weren't feeling well and reached for the pills. So then Stanley and Teresa took it because they had a headache. Later on passed. We all loved each other, you know. Joe Janice is the older brother of Adam and Stanley. They all came to Chicago from Poland for a better life. My brother, my brothers were the, the, it was everything to me. All had good jobs. Joe and Stanley owned an auto parts store. Everything we try so hard in this country was going okay for us. And one day, everything fell apart. Joe was with Stanley as the poison kicked in. He just fell down. And uh, when he fell, his mouth was white stuff was coming out from his mouth. His eyes turned backwards, I seen, you know. So they called the ambulance. When the ambulance arrived, Teresa also collapsed. It's awful. One of the worst calls I've ever been on in my life. Chuck Kramer, an Arlington Heights Fire Department lieutenant at the time, was working on Stanley when Teresa grabbed him and fell. As soon as I turned her over, a second ago she was holding on my arm, and now she's there and her eyes are fixed and dilated and non-reactive to light again. The amount of cyanide had she had in her would have killed 26 elephants. What kind of person opens up a capsule and fills it with cyanide? 
and puts it back in a jar and puts it on a shelf. He's an animal that he, he kills people with no fear. 19-year-old Theresa Janis and 25-year-old Stanley Janis were married in this church just three months ago. Images of their caskets and Adam's casket at the altar created even more panic and pain. I remember my father approaching Adam's coffin and he just couldn't take it. He literally threw his body on top of my uncle and the coffin almost tipped over. I'll never forget that. It was terrible just seeing that. What are you thinking about right now? I don't feel like, you know, living anymore. 40 years, guys. What a tragedy for your family. Our Father, heart in heaven. When you speak of the victims, you speak of them as family. Yeah. That was real hard. The Janus killings were the key to finding all seven deaths were caused by tainted Tylenol. Chuck Kramer was part of a team that quickly made that heroic discovery. It brings back a lot of memories. Meet retired nurse Helen Jensen. She's also one of those heroes. She worked the Janus case along with Kramer. Both suspected there was something deadly inside the Tylenol. I got a phone call from the fire department from Chuck Kramer. They compared notes from all three Janus deaths. And then Nurse Jensen sounded the alarm at the hospital where Adam, Stanley, and Teresa all died. I went back to the emergency room, presented it to the medical examiner and the police, and they laughed at me. She was already saying, it's got to be Tylenol. The three people took Tylenol. And they weren't believing her at that point. I stamped my feet. I was angry. <laughs> no, I really did. I reiterated, it has to be, and this is why it has to be. And I can get very adamant but they did not believe me. To prove her theory, she actually went over to the Janus home to search for the original bottle of Tylenol. Each of the Janices had taken two capsules before they died. And I went into the bathroom and found a bottle of Tylenol and I brought it out to the kitchen with one of the police officers. I opened it and counted the pills and there were six pills missing and there were three people dead. I said, it has to be the Tylenol. Then she kept searching the home for any other kind of clues. I also went through the garbage and found the receipt that this had been purchased at Jewel that morning. I'm holding it, the bottle and the receipt. And I laid it out in front of the medical examiner and I counted it again and told him the same thing. There are six capsules missing. There are three people dead. There has to be a correlation. Oh, no, that's fine. The Tylenol's fine. Meanwhile, Chuck Kramer was also still piecing together clues and tracked down a paramedic who responded to 12-year-old Mary Kellerman's emergency. She was the 12-year-old junior high student who earlier that day collapsed at her parents' home in Elk Grove Village. A little girl died this morning in Elk Grove, and she took Tylenol. And it's the same symptoms, rapid shallow breathing, fixed dilated pupils, and unreactive. He, like Nurse Jensen, also reported his findings to hospital officials, but no one was believing either of them. Yeah, I was angry. I went home. I was very upset. I was teary. I had a stiff drink and talked to my husband. And I finally went to bed. At 5.30 in the morning, he got up really early, and he came in to me. He said, Helen, you're right. They're saying it on the news. It was Tylenol. Lab analysis of the crystals of cyanide may lead investigators to the manufacturer. Jensen and Kramer were instrumental in the action that came next, the immediate removal of all Tylenol from stores and homes, saving an unknown number of lives from other potentially poisoned capsules. Dave? Hi, Chuck. Okay, how you doing? Good, how are you? Okay. Are you ready to do this? All right, we're going to give it a try. All right, well, we'll see you over by the grave. Okay. Forty years later, the now 81-year-old Chuck Kramer still often manages to visit the Janus family graves to pay his respects. I want to thank him for doing that, you know, coming and see my, my brother's grave. You're all connected. Yes, yes. Well, someday we'll be all connected on t upstairs. Yeah, that's what they say. What's the main emotion you, f you feel when you 
when you stand here and you look at anger this. that someone would do that. He prays one day Isabel, Monica, and Joe Janice and the rest of their family will find closure and see justice. I watched family end. I don't know how anybody could do anything like that. And as the killer remains free, the Janice family says after all these decades, Arlington Heights police and the FBI have yet to reach out to Joe Janice about the status of his family's murder case. He said that no detective, no agent ever contacted him to update him ever. Never. Nobody approached him. No police, no detectives, nobody. What do you think of that? I think it's absolutely the strangest thing I've ever heard in my life. Your father deserves to know. He does deserve to know. I just see him cry all the time. Joe Janice moved his family away from Chicago to the Wisconsin Dells, a new life with his daughter Monica and grandchildren, including Isabel. But the family never escapes the pain. It's embedded in their DNA. It's, it's hard for me to live. But I still got my daughter, my son, my grandchildren. I gotta live for them. I truly believe that justice will be done, if not in this lifetime, then in the next. In loving memory of Adam Janus, Stanley Janus, and Teresa Janus. Monica and her father, Joe Janus, say the only time they ever spoke with police was last year. Monica got an anonymous tip. She's the one who contacted police. They've heard nothing since. Dave Savini, CBS2 Investigators. Joining me now for under the stream, always good to have you, CBS2 Investigator Dave Savini. Dave Savini, thanks so much for your time. Tell us a bit. I know it's hard to encapsulate just how much this family has been through. Well, when you think about the Tylenol murders, no family faced a, a greater amount of tragedy than this family. Three people died all within a few hours of each other. Adam Janis was a mailman uh, and he lived in Arlington Heights and he was a very physically fit guy. Uh, they were called suddenly the rest of the family and they said Adam had had a heart attack and um, was dead. So they rushed to the hospital out in uh, the Arlington Heights area. They lived on the northwest side of Chicago, the rest of the Janice family. And they get to the hospital, they're weeping over Adam Janice's body and um, they decide to go back to Adam's house to plan the funeral. And when they get to Adam's house, a couple of the people in the family were experiencing headaches and some back pain. So Stanley Janice, uh, another brother, and his wife, Teresa Janice, his newlywed wife, they go into the medicine cabinet and they grab what was a basically a brand new bottle of Tylenol that Adam had bought that morning because he called in sick for work that day and went over to the local jewel store and bought that bottle of Tylenol. They, of course, then took the, the Tylenol, the tainted Tylenol, unknowingly, and they dropped to the floor, collapsed with uh, symptoms that all these other people had been dying from in the Chicago area, but they were all isolated cases. This was the first time that there was a mass group of people and they're significant. Their deaths are super significant to stopping the sale and destroying the Tylenol that was out there on the shelves because they were the linchpin. They were the case that put it all together where everyone zeroed in on the Tylenol. Before we get to that, Dave, let's transport people because we've been working on this for months. We have some remarkable file footage. Let's take people back 40 years to the CBS2 archives to take a look at some of the emotion from that time. 19-year-old Theresa Janis and 25-year-old Stanley Janis were married in this church just three months ago. Today, their caskets were carried by members of their wedding party. Services for Stanley's brother, 27-year-old Adam Janis, were held here too. Adam took it, he died first, and then Stanley and Teresa took it because they had a headache. Later on passed. The amount of cyanide had, she had in her would have killed 26 elephants. What kind of person opens up a capsule and fills it with cyanide and puts it back in a jar and puts it on a shelf? He's an animal that he, he kills people 
with no fear. The, no detective, no agent ever t contacted him to update him ever? Never. Nobody approached him. No police, no detectives, nobody. What do you think of that? I think it's absolutely the strangest thing I've ever heard in my life. Your father deserves to know. He does deserve to know. I just see him cry all the time. The toll really hits home when you see one family and, and three caskets. And when you conducted your interviews uh, over the past several months with the Janice family, um, they said repeatedly they had never been contacted by really anyone from the task force, any investigators for four decades. Is, is that still the case? Yeah, imagine that, and that is the case. The, the, as a matter of fact, the only time anyone from the Janice family talked to the authorities, according to the family, is when Monica Janice called the police to say she had gotten an anonymous tip about a year ago. So she relayed the information to them, and that was it. Um, no one's ever updated them, kept them in the loop on what's happening, just checked in to see how they're doing. This family really has lost all hope that the real killer will ever be found. Joe Janice doesn't want to go to his grave without seeing the day that the man or woman responsible for this heinous crime is finally brought to justice. Dave, part of the remarkable story about the Janice family here is they were really the linchpin in the investigation. People otherwise healthy, young individuals were dropping dead in Chicago and greater Chicago for 24 hours and nobody knew why. It was the Janice family and really a rather heroic paramedic and a heroic nurse who, who added it up with the family, did they not? They made the connection between the deaths and, and, and something with Tylenol, correct? Exactly. When you think about what those two individuals did, Lieutenant Chuck Kramer from the Arlington Heights Fire Department, who was in charge of the EMS scene that night at the Janice house, uh, two calls to that house in one day, Adam with a heart attack, and then brother and sister-in-law also fall with similar symptoms. So Lieutenant Kramer shows up, and as he shows up, Teresa Janice, the, the wife of Stanley is falling on him. They're there for Stanley, who's already on the ground, eyes rolled back, uh, white stuff coming out of his mouth, and now his sister, or his, now his wife um, is on the ground. And, and you have Lieutenant Kramer, he doesn't know what's happening here. He doesn't know if he's, there's a carbon monoxide leak, a gas leak, he doesn't know some sort of infectious disease going on. He's trying to figure out what happened, and all he knew was that they all took Tylenol. Now, he was friends with this nurse who he told the same story to, and she said, it's got to be the Tylenol. So Nurse Helen Jensen goes over to the house and searches the house and finds a Tylenol bottle. And you know, the Tylenol bottles and all kinds of pill bottles, you can buy 100 pills, 120 pills, it usually says on the bottle. She counts the pills and realizes that there are six pills missing from that bottle. She also finds the receipt in the trash can of where he bought that Tylenol bottle earlier in the day at Jewel. She did so much investigative work and so did Lieutenant Kramer that they brought that information back to the medical director at the hospital and said, it's gotta be the Tylenol, it's gotta be the Tylenol. By five o'clock in the morning, the next day, everyone in Chicago, every news station blasting out, police on bullhorns, it's Tylenol, do not take Tylenol. The panic, the fear was everywhere. Children in schools, uh, teenagers in high school were told to bring any Tylenol they might have in their lockers or in their purses to the school offices to be destroyed. It's a remarkable story. And looking back at some of that file footage you and I have, Dave, over the past several months of working on this, I mean, Halloween was actually canceled in, in right. certain communities because there was such a fear over tainted candy, tainted food. It r really changed the game here. Uh, you know, Brad, I, I, th there's a human element here. There's a toll, and we talked about the toll this family took. And I, I wanna kinda touch upon a little bit about the Janice family. They, their father, Joe Janice's father, brought him and his brothers over from Poland when they were young boys for a better life. His father was never the same after this. 
he felt responsible for what happened to his children, his grown sons. He felt like it was his fault. Had they stayed in Poland and not come over here, this might not have ever happened. Dave, another remarkable and telling interview you got. Uh, Monica Janis was just eight years old at the time. She lost th three relatives. Uh, and, and she remembers, you know, specifically these crystallized memories, FBI being around, et cetera. And, and here we are, a generation or two removed from that, and the recall of that event is, is total. Imagine that again. I mean, she was just a little girl. She was in elementary school in Chicago in the suburbs, uh, Morton Grove area, and she had agents placed around her school. She had a brother as well, and they were all around the perimeter. They would watch them when they were on the playground. They would ride on the bus with them from school to home and vice versa. They would be in the, near the classrooms. Uh, they would be not seen. There, were, there was an idea, there was a uh, speculation that possibly they were a target and that some madman or some devious person was going to come back and maybe spy on them or watch them. They also had cameras, uh, as they told me, that were placed far away, uh, focused on the graves at that cemetery. Uh, outside of the cemetery, there are fences around the perimeter, and there were people in cars watching the graves to see if the killer might come back to stand over the graves, some form or fashion of a visitation, whether a sickening fascination or Maybe it was personal, maybe it was somebody. So this is what was going on in their lives at very young age. FBI involvement, agents everywhere. That was the kind of hysteria that we were dealing with at that moment. Yeah, I mean, you often hear about criminals returning to crime scene, criminals keeping, keeping tokens from victims, if you will. Part of your story that also touched me, you're dealing now with really four generations, if you will, of one family. I mean, you want to talk about multi-generational trauma. Uh, it may not be embodied in any more family than it is the Janus family here from greater Chicago, lost three loved ones in the Tylenol killings of, of 1982. They now have a granddaughter in Wisconsin who recently took up a school project, Dave. So Isabel Janice, Monica's daughter, was asked to uh, write a, a special essay, all the kids were in her class, on their heritage, their family heritage. And she was supposed to write something on her Polish heritage. And she came back with a paper that was written about the Tylenol murders. And her professors, her teachers, were floored. They, they didn't even know that they had a student in the school that had a connection to the Tylenol murders. So they sat down with her and the family and they said, listen, still write the Polish heritage paper because we want you to focus in on you know, the family and, and all of the uh, traditions that you, you, you grew up with. And the family was a close family, Brad. This was a family that, you know, they gathered for desserts and pierogies. Everything was family, family, family. They stuck together. This was a devastating blow to them. And this little girl, now 12, Isabel Janice, this is what she relates to. She knows about the murders. She knows her uncles and aunt were murdered. And she writes this paper. And you know what she says in it? Her goal one day is to be the person that solves the crime. She wants to investigate as she grows up. She wants to learn some of these skills. And she wants to try to find who did it. And she might be the one. This all went down September 29th, 1982. September 29th, 2022. 40 years later, unsolved, you are doing the anniversary piece what do viewers and why do viewers need to watch this? This is a piece of history. This is a piece of history in Chicago history and in our nation's history that changed everything that has to do 
with anything you buy on a store shelf, whether it's a, a pill or something you eat. And the protective sealants and coatings and coverings, that's what this led to. But because this wound has never had a chance to heal, the crime has never been solved, you have these families that have lost seven people and there's never been anyone brought to justice. So we hope people walk away with the essence of this family, the Janus family, and the generational trauma they carry with them all the way down to this most current generation. Young people should see this story to understand what happened in this country, in the city of Chicago back in 1982. A lot of us will remember being there. I was in high school when this all happened. I remember cleaning out the medicine cabinet at home and getting rid of the Tylenol. We all did. It's what everybody did. It's like Tylenol comes off the shelves everywhere. It's destroyed. It's gone. We want people to see the heroes, the heroes that stopped it at seven. The ones that found out it was Tylenol was the common denominator right away. Lieutenant Chuck Kramer, Nurse Helen Jensen. And we're going to show you some of the police that were involved, uh, unrelated to the task force and the agents, uh, but the local police uh, going into homes to try to find Tylenol in the victims' homes that had already died. And they wanted to make sure they got every bottle that might have been possible where they knew there was a contamination case. What they did in those first moments. It's really about the heroes and the family that meant everything to maybe not solving the case, but to stopping and controlling the damage and death toll. Dave Savini, CBS2 investigator, friend of the stream. We appreciate your insight and thank you for joining us on the stream. Again, this is part of a much bigger project, a massive undertaking here at CBS News Chicago. It has now been 40 years since seven people died after taking extra strength Tylenol laced with cyanide a crime never solved. A body is never laid to rest, they say, until there is some type of justice. In this case, there is not. That's why we are working on this docu-series. It is called Painkiller. Unsolved, now 40 years. Here's a preview of that. It was probably one of the first acts of domestic terrorism. A frightening pattern began to take shape some five hours later in the neighboring suburb of Arlington Heights. When you live through something like that, you'll never forget it. This was a terrible tragedy for seven families. It took my life, shattered my life um, and my family life. Calls have been coming into the investigative task force so heavily that all seven lines into the center have been almost constantly jammed. If it can happen with this, what else can it happen? Have you found a common denominator? No, sir. We're working in conjunction with Johnson & Johnson in an effort to determine if there is a common denominator. Who would think of that? What kind of mind thinks about that? The search for the Tylenol cyanide killer continues to center on this photograph. Have you ever done an interview about this? No, only with the FBI. Seven people? You're going to let a murderer just go? Why can't the authorities arrest this man? He's a madman. Kansas City Police Sergeant David Barton was watching an evening news broadcast when he saw a picture of a man who looked familiar. I jumped off the couch, said, that's damn James Lewis. You remember the name Lewis? I just told you that three times. Just another one of the ups that plagued this case. We're actively pursuing this investigation. Uh, this is not collecting dust on a shelf. I don't think it'll ever be solved in 40 years. You would think that somebody would say something. Have you ever seen this guy? Hi. Mr. Lewis? If this was on the shelves then, we wouldn't be sitting here now. 